Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Sri Andi Silva Vijay Ratna, Managing Director and CEO of Textured Jersey Lanka, joins us in the studio today as we continue to focus on the apparel industry. The Managing Director of Nielsen Shine Card assesses the LNB Nielsen Business Confidence Index, which remained virtually unchanged in April. And in our final segment, LNB columnist Deshal Dimel takes an in depth look at Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. We continue our focus on the apparel industry today on the program and today we have with us Sriyan De Silva Vijay Ratna, the Managing Director and CEO of Textured Jersey Lanka. In today's discussion, we will be addressing quite a number of issues pertaining to the industry, including the impact of the growing competition regionally that we have from Pakistan, Bangladesh and of course Vietnam on Sri Lanka's apparel industry. Sriyan, very good to have you on the show. Thank you, Shavitri. It's been my pleasure. Just to begin and to give us an overview, what is the industry looking like these days? Well, I mean, this is a, you know, it's an exciting industry, but at the same time, it's not an e easy industry to be in. Uh, the global industry, I mean, over the next, say, 12 to 15 years will pretty much double. So it's not a sunset industry. There's still a lot of growth, but within that, there's a lot of dynamism. So really, I think the angle for Sri Lanka is really, you know, where you want to play and how. But otherwise, I think it's an exciting industry to be in. Um, unfortunately for Sri Lanka, it's one of the few industries which has really emerged over the last couple of decades to be of national significance from a manufacturing perspective. So that puts added pressure on the industry per se when it comes to the broader picture of the Sri Lankan economy. Um, well, we're facing a little bit of regional competition, so to speak. Pakistan enjoys GSP Plus, and so does Bangladesh. Vietnam is trying to negotiate a uh, free trade agreement. Uh, what are we supposed to do? How are we facing up to this growing competition? Well, I think uh, the, the apparel industry survived the first onslaught, so to speak, many years ago when the tariff barriers were readjusted. Uh, you lost all the benefits and all of that, and they still survived. So I, I think uh, there is plenty of room still to manage this wave of competition, so to speak. Uh, TPP is a couple of years down the line. So I think uh, as an industry, we have time to kind of look at that and, you know, weigh the pros and cons and understand our responses. Uh, from a, you know, South Asian kind of perspective, when it comes to the bras and briefs category, Sri Lanka is, you know, holding its own pretty well. Uh, price, productivity-wise, we have certain edges that we can sustain. Uh, Bangladesh has its edges on, you know, outerwear, a couple of these areas. And uh, so I think the answer for Sri Lanka has to be to pick and choose the areas that it's wanting to focus on value addition and innovation. Th these would be the key, you know, answers for the future. Uh, embracing technology would be a third because a lot of dynamics are changing in the industry. So as long as we can play within those areas rather than get into a bloodbath of uh, competition, I think the apparel industry still has room to grow. What are the global trends we are seeing, uh, Sriyan, in terms of innovation, in terms of, uh, well, in terms of technology? Uh, that Sri Lanka needs to be made aware of? Well, if you start on the clothing side, you know, you have the whole sportswear, athleisure kind of trend where, you know, the, the uh, kind of apparel that you wear is changing and people are going into more what originated from the yoga pants kind of trend into a more lasting fashion now. And that athleisure segment is growing tremendously. So that means the, the segments that you cater to uh, will need to keep an eye out on that side. In the more distant area, you get the phenomena of smart technologies. And, you know, smart technologies means that, you know, people uh, will be, you know, 
having more wearable technologies where you know your heartbeat, your pulse rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these, you know, the, 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 the coming together of nanotechnology, uh, software, and clothing is going to create exciting options which are going to kind of span the boundaries between medicine, sports, casual wear, and clothing. So, so I think the, the, the dynamics are going to be quite interesting. So Sri Lanka will probably, you know, the apparel industry will need to keep an eye on these. Uh, at the same time, it will have to learn to partner. Sri Lanka is not, you know, R&D is not our domain as a country, you know, and uh, we don't have enough of uh, national R&D infrastructure and R&D, uh, I would say, a footprint and a spend level. So therefore, Sri Lanka will need to partner with companies and uh, uh, players outside our shores. And uh, so I think the answer would lie there, how well we can partner where we bring some strengths to the table, but you look at places who can bring the R&D knowledge, fuse that, and then look at how to uh, support that with the manufacturing excellence that we have. Speaking of technology, uh, what, uh, what ways has technology actually enabled pr production process thus far? Well, <clears throat> I, I think if you look at the you know, manufacturing process per se, if I start with that both on the textile side and the apparel side, uh, you have a lot of traditionally uh, people-related functions, inspections, uh, you know, lots of things like that, which cameras and things are taking over and, you know, that's reducing the need for manual intervention, so to speak, it's speeding up the process. The, the sophistication at which uh, garments are cut, margins are shrinking, patterns are getting mixed and matched, digital printing is coming into the equation, mix, which makes a huge difference to the variations that you can create on fabric and things like that. So that side, there's a whole spectrum of technology which has entered this space. Now, what's interesting, and uh, again from my history in technology, what I find more exciting is the fact that there is an invasion, so to speak, of the apps, the, you know, the wonderful apps which sit on our mobiles and on the desktops and all of that. The app movement is making a huge, you know, making number of inroads into the traditional area of the manufacturing and the industry, which was normally supported by large machinery and all of that. Today, you know, that there, there are people who are coming up with ideas and having products where, you know, simply with a mobile phone camera and, you know, a couple of uh, photographs and gestures, it can now give you 3D images of your, you know, your size, your clothing fit, and the likes. Now these were massive cameras and you know technology which were needed in the past to get a 3D fit, right? The app world has come in and taken that over. Barcoding, you know with barcoding tomorrow you will just scan a barcode with your mobile phone and it will tell you whether the garment fits you, what you look like in it and you know so th th there's a silent revolution taking place which is uh, going to drastically alter the way uh, apparel and fabric making is going to happen. So I, I think uh, the, uh, whether we like it or not, the, the, the software domain is just widening its influence. And you know, the apparel industry will have to shake off its history around traditional uh, uh, ways of making uh, fabric and garments and all of that, and start you know, readjusting to this movement. So we're taking a short break, Sri, and we'll be continuing with this discussion. We pause for some messages from our sponsors. On the other side, we have Sri De Silva, who will expand on the sustainability measures that's being adopted by the industry and whether Sri Lanka can actually achieve its target of 8.5 billion US dollars by 2020. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, 
but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Pathum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to Benchmark. We're having a chat on Benchmark with Sriyan De Silva Vijayaratna, Managing Director and CEO of Texture Jersey Lanka. Getting back to what we were discussing, uh, Sriyan, what are the main constraints that actually face the supply chain? Because lead times have now got very compressed. What you all used to take six months to do, now it's six weeks or sometimes six days. So, yeah, I think, you know, that's where I guess, uh, you know, the local textile industry also, you know, comes to support in a big way. When the apparel industry started many, you know, couple of decades ago, the value addition component was much smaller. Uh, you used to rely a lot on imports. Uh, thankfully now, especially the textile industry, you know, we $350-400 million of turnover from local mills. So actually the, the industry is kind of, it's almost like it has grown in the shadow of this large apparel tree, but it's time to kind of bring it out because it's much larger than some, than some of the more traditional industries that we kind of consider as industries. People don't realize that you have a massive textile industry which has also emerged. So that has helped also to contribute to lead time reduction because the, the requirements in the customer side is a lot more fast fashion, read and react, faster turnaround times, you know, uh, more innovation, more rapid change. So having mills and supply chain locally, at least to cover a portion of the requirement, helps quite a lot. So I think that's important. Uh, the other one is that today I think people have more visibility uh, and we are more connected with different sources and all of that. So you can kind of balance your sourcing and, you know, uh, things like that to actually cater to the needs of the supply chain. So TJ on our part, you know, we also have uh, big plans to kind of expand because we still see that there's a lot more that uh, textile mills could bring to the table. And on our part, we want to also become one of the largest players in South Asia. And so we are also very keen to align closely with the apparel industry on that journey, do more. But otherwise the key players, you know, the textile, uh, elastic, thread, buttons, you know, a lot of these ingredients are around. The people factor is also there in a, you know, decent uh, scale and skill. So I, I think uh, there, there's still a lot go going for us. How much has the apparel industry progressed on the sustainability front? Well, this is a, you know, it, it's obviously the buzzword, an important area. And that's the area that especially some of the global brands are putting a lot of focus. Uh, thankfully, the leading players in the country here have been embracing this for a while now. So sustainability, I mean, uh, we as a company have been doing a lot on sustainability. The leading uh, Brandy, XMS, Hydromani, it's all the big companies have also been embracing these notions for a while now. So I think they've uh, got smarter and rather than trying to fight the notion, have been looking at ways to kind of embrace it and make it part of the core philosophy they operate. Because this is not going to be a choice. A couple of years down the line, there are brands who are insisting on zero chemical discharge and, you know, the, the parameters are going up, right? So we as companies are looking at, you know, better liquor ratios when we bring in machinery, um, faster throughput times, you know, lower chemical usages, smarter ways of uh, manufacture and all of that. So there's a lot going on. Now, speaking of Texture Jersey, you boast of uh, two of the best run companies you are a shareholder of, that is Hong Kong based Pacific Textiles and Brandix Lucker. Um, if you look at tie ups for the industry, 
is there scope for that with, with, with global players so that we'll become more competitive? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, I would say a very big yes. Because uh, what, what people need to understand and realize is that the dynamics globally are changing. So, for example, let's look at online. What's happening with online purchasing? The online, you know, uh, purchasing is growing at a rapid play, pace. It's still small, but it, the, the rate of growth is phenomenal. Uh, then you have players like Amazon. In, I think, by 2017 or something like that, Amazon is going to be selling more clothing than Macy's or Walmart, right? So they'll be the largest garment retailer in the world, and they don't have a store, they don't manufacture, right? As opposed to the known brands. So what it means is that there are very interesting opportunities out there to partner players who we would have never ever imagined talking to. So in the past, if we talked to a traditional textile mill, apparel manufacturer, in the past we would have said, oh, there's a large apparel company and you know we make great partners. We are a company, you're a company, let's find some common ground. Now, lots of companies from R&D to smart textile to retailing to online clothing, any of which you could kind of pick and say strategically, let's make a partner, let's make a consortium and take products out into the market. So I think we need to get a bit smarter at, the, you know, at changing dynamics, protect your core, but uh, partnerships absolutely has to be the way to go. You know, Sriyan, the textile and apparel industry uh, is about 48% of our total exports. And like you mentioned, the textile industry is big. It's 101.5 million US dollars as opposed to uh, the apparel industry, 4.6 billion. But it's it's a big industry. Um, do you think Sri Lanka can actually achieve that 8.5 billion US dollars? Well, <clears throat> I think you can't fault the apparel industry for being ambitious. Let's face it, these were all visionary people who had ideas and dreams which were much bigger than the reality that the rest of the country saw. And that's the reason that we've got to where we are. If we had, you know, uh, leaders who are thinking small, I think we wouldn't have got the four or five billion dollar apparel industry we have. They are players, they see the big picture, they take the risk, they want to, you know, think ahead of the curve, all of that. So I think when you say, look, can we achieve the 8.5 billion dollar targets that we've said, I think part of it is about the achievement, part of it is about the journey. Uh, so. The industry right now is challenging. Um, you see, you know, some of the destabilization of Europe and, you know, all these dynamics coming in. So it's not like everything is hunky-dory in the world. So that makes it that much more challenging. But this is not something which is a pipe dream, right? So that there are enough fundamentals which are working for the apparel industry to get there or I would say even get reasonably close. I have worked in industries where people have, you know, set targets only to happily remove them and set them every two years at uh, today plus five years and feel no worry about the fact that they keep moving the targets. But the one industry who has made a difference of scale in the country is the apparel industry. So I think in that sense they have a track record of saying, you know, we'll chase something, we'll dream. And, you know, we, we think we'll uh, get somewhere there. So I think uh, if there is an industry who might get closely to achieve it, it's the apparel. So what is the way forward for the industry? way forward would have to be both inward looking and outward looking. Inward looking to kind of tighten up the manufacturing processes, get more productive, invest a lot more in technology and investing people at the same time. Uh, it would be inward looking in the sense of government and private sector kind of partnering a lot closer, getting better alignment between the policy framework and the priorities of the industry and, you know, supporting uh, local companies who need to expand, uh, getting their better alignment with the supply chain, that kind of thing. Outward looking because, you know, a lot of what we are wanting to do is out there rather than in here. And we'll have to keep an eye on that, understand, expose people, bring some of the talent in. Sri Lanka is a funny country where we love to export our talent and, you know, have them working in other countries and sending money. 
but uh, we make it extremely difficult for people to come into the country and work. And we just block off a lot of uh, knowledge transfer. So we need to just make life uh, easy for both capital, knowledge, and technology to come in. So if we can create that inside-outside view, then I think the apparel industry would do very well. Thank you, Sri, and I hope someone's listening to your suggestions and taking heed. I would hope so too. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We've been speaking with Managing Director and CEO Sriyan De Silva Vijay Ratna. He's of Textured Jersey Lanka. And we've been discussing the apparel and textile industry. On the other side, we have Anushan Selvaraja, who will give you a little bit more on the macro picture. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now we'll take a look at the latest with the Business Confidence Index. And joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Carter. Welcome back, Shaheen. Now, uh, to start off with, the BCI has remained uh, virt virtually flat. It, uh, it hasn't changed since last month. Now, what are the reasons behind this? What sort of concerns have been raised by the poll respondents? Actually, there have been two opposing sort of uh, forces, if you may say, uh, keeping the BCI static. On the, on the optimistic side, you know, business uh, revenues are increasing the last financial year and so on. So that is sort of uh, the plus side. But the, damp the dampening effect on the BCI has really been concerns about the economy and also the, the, defla uh, the depreciation of the rupee, so which has sort of acted to keep the BCI in the same, uh, at the same level. Where do respondents stand in terms of our business prospects? Yeah, because earnings have been good in the last one year, so uh, respondents expect the same to continue next one year to be very positive as well. I mean, 60% expect their businesses to do even better, and only 13% say that, you know, business will be worse in the next 12 months. What about our investment climate, uh, Shaheen? Where do respondents stand? Uh, what are the issues that they have uh, cited? Yeah, Anushan, so here we see a paradox. You know, the, the strong earnings uh, have not uh, really translated to um, investment uh, optimism, I would say. So the percentage saying they would um, consider investment is only 24% in April, compared to almost double that number, 47% in March. Now, uh, the reasons for this is because I think there is concern that the economy is stagnating, the, and as well as, as I said, the depreciation of the rupee. Um, also, I think the, the tax policies also have been mentioned by some respondents as causing confusion and therefore uh, giving, uh, resulting in some reluctance to invest. Based on this shine, what would be your projections for the future of the BCI? I think the index is, uh, is, uh, is suppressed uh, largely due to concerns of the economy. And uh, unless there's visible evidence of a lot of economic spurt of economic activity, I think the index would either remain static or perhaps even marginally decline. Thank you for joining us, Shaheen. You're welcome.
That was the managing director of Nilsson Shaheen Kada. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Gami Pubudua, our microfinance offering makes it possible for the youth of this country who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. We are committed to grassroots level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at Sri Lanka's macro picture, joining me is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Welcome back to the show, Deshal. Now uh, to start off with, VAT has been increased and it's been placed on a certain number of products and services. Now, uh, what exactly are the products and services that are affected by this and how would this affect our economy on the whole? Yeah, Anushin, uh, the VAT increase will of course have a general, uh, across the board, there will be uh, uh, an impact in terms of an increase in, uh, in prices. Uh, but I think what is important to recognize is the fact that this is something that is necessary given the current fiscal constraints faced by the government. Uh, it's a well-documented narrative, the fact that the government has been short on, on the revenue front for uh, for a while now, and it's necessary to, uh, to address this at, uh, at some level. Um, it would, have, it would have been ideal if this had been done in the, in the previous budget in uh, November 2015, whether it would have been a more Kind of measured way of, uh, of approaching revenue in a probably a more holistic manner. Um, but I think what has been done now is to, um, to address a relatively simple way of collection with minimum administrative processes to, uh, to ensure you can meet the kind of revenue shortfalls that we have been facing uh, without causing too much disruption in the, in the short term. In the longer term, though, the real the, what needs to be done is to address issues of uh, revenue administration to ensure that there are less uh, less leakages in the tax system, less loopholes, um, a degree of um, of, um, of modification of the current concessions that are given, and a number of other uh, aspects of reducing uh, of reducing leakages in the revenue system. That is really what is going to be a more sustainable approach to uh, to enhancing revenue and enhancing the fiscal situation and at the same time of course rationalization of uh, government's expenditure particularly recurrent expenditure on our investment front they shall have what sort of issues are we facing well, it, uh, there are different issues in the different types of investment. If you look at uh, FDI, for instance, we have still been quite uh, relatively slow in terms of uh, the pickup of, uh, of FDI. Sri Lanka still has relatively low levels of investment as a percentage of GDP compared to the region and compared to global averages and so on. And there are a number of reasons for this. There have been issues in terms of Sri Lanka's um, in terms of like Sri Lanka's labor market. There are issues in terms of, of skill availability, in terms of uh, infrastructure as well, certain things like access to water at industrial scale, uh, and a number of issues along along those lines. Productivity has always been an issue uh, for uh, for investors in Sri Lanka. The fact that even though Sri Lanka is a Sri Lanka is now no longer a, a low cost center for uh, in terms of wages, and that coupled with the issue of low, low levels of productivity makes Sri Lanka relatively unattractive from an investment perspective particularly when you have limited access in terms of skills on the scale that you would have in some of the other countries in our region. So a number of these factors in combination make Sri Lanka 
a little bit more difficult to in terms of attracting uh, in terms of uh, attracting FDI. What needs to be done is to push and to leverage Sri Lanka's locational advantages, the logistics, the trade agreements that we have with our neighboring markets. Uh, and those are some of the, the advantages factors that we have, and that I think those are the areas that, that can be leveraged to a great extent to push FDI uh, in a bigger way. Uh, in certain other markets, for instance, if you look at the, the bond market uh, or the global capital markets, there has been a general sentiment uh, uh, against uh, emerging markets in the last six months or so with capital moving out of emerging frontier markets and Sri Lanka has been one of the countries that has been adversely affected by that. Uh, that coupled with Sri Lanka's adverse uh, uh, determinants on the, on the fiscal uh, indicators has also made uh, investors relatively uh, less favourable towards Sri Lanka. With the announcement of the recent uh, IMF package, there has been some uh, improvement in uh, investor sentiment. We've seen a, a positive impact on the stock market and also in terms of interest rates, they have been improving to an extent in terms of yields of both on the dollar uh, end and the rupee end as well. So some improved sentiment, but of course that will all depend, the longevity of that will depend on the momentum that we maintain on the reform process that the IMF program would enter. Now in your latest article in the LMB magazine, you mentioned that the central bank rejected bids for uh, on our bond market. Now, how would this affect our capital market? There were a couple of instances, I think, in March uh, at one point when um, all bids were rejected and I think months before that as well. Um, what happens in that kind of situation is that then you are forced to take on a larger volume of uh, volume of bonds in, in later auctions, at times pushing interest rates above uh, what they were previously and that happened in uh, towards the end of March as well. Um, and of course, then that we what what we noticed in that uh, in some of those auctions in March, where you had um, uh, yields in the primary auction being significantly higher than, and then falling off and reducing in, in the second secondary market, uh, which um, creates a degree of volatility in the interest rates in uh, in the in the capital in the bond market in particular. Um, that now seems to have uh, mitigated to an extent. We've seen the longer term yields coming down uh, to a to a to a great extent. The the issue though is that usually what happens with, um, with the, the interest rates on the government securities market is that it sets a benchmark for the entire economy, and most of the other interest rates would be based on that. So once those interest rates start, with, once the government security yields start going up, it kind of causes the general shift upwards on uh, interest rates overall. Uh, but it appears now that uh, to a great to some extent that we have reached uh, a, a level of peak at least at the higher at the longer end of the yield curve uh, and hopefully with the IMF uh, package coming in and the associated reforms um, if those do get anchored and are sustainable then we should see interest rates stabilizing and hopefully coming down a little bit from these levels thank you very much for joining us Desha. thank you Desha. that was economist and LMB columnist Deshali Mel thank you for watching benchmark and we hope to see you again next time